So the title of the presentation today is Identity Matters, Lineage, Dependencies, and Pediatric Gliomas. And we're lucky to have Dr. Claudia Kleiman joining us. She is an associate professor in the Department of Human Genetics um, at McGill University up in Montreal, Canada. She's a full-time investigator at the Lady Davis Institute for Medical Research and an associate member of the McGill Center for Translational Research in Cancer. Um, she's also a researcher at the Ludmer Center for Neuroinformatics and Mental Health. So the talk today is an exciting one. Um, I think this is the first time we've had a talk um, sort of in this area, um, in this lecture series. We're going to we're going to hear about computational strategies for analyzing multimodal tumor data sets, fo focusing on sy systematic identification of tumor origins by generating single cell resolution maps of the developing brain to catalog cell populations um, where these tumors arise. So this is really exciting in, in a cancer um, brain, brain tumors that are very important to Alex's. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Kleiman, and we look forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you very much for the invitation, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me show my slides. Can you see them properly? OK, so again, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we'll be talking today about our work, trying to identify the origins of the tumors, uh, pediatric brain tumors, specifically high gliomas. And we'll be discussing why we think Finding where these tumors arise, when these tumors arise, is important for understanding their pathogenesis, for modeling these tumors, and for eventually targeting them. Uh, so we will be focusing on high-grade gliomas, these tumors that are extremely uh, aggressive and deadly, and are often, often caused by mutations in histone genes, these proteins where the DNA is wrapped around and that are key uh, players in the regulation of gene expression through um, post-translational modifications of these histone tails. So these tumors are often caused by mutations in two residues, either lysine 27 or glycine 36, uh, in three different histone variants. And these mutations will affect the position and spread of key regulatory marks, the repressive mark k 27 me 3 also activating marks K27 acetylation and uh, indirectly affecting the position of and read, reading and writing of K36 ME3, which is associated with active genes. So the effect of, the, um, of these mutations on the epigenome is quite large, quite uh, important, particularly for K27M. Uh, this mutation will act globally in trans uh, preventing the function of PRC2, a complex that deposits, deposits these uh, repressive marks in large domains of the genome, affecting coordinated expression of gene programs and producing a global decrease of this mark in the cell. So the effect of, the, uh, of these mutations in the epigenome is absolutely catastrophic uh, with uh, large removal of this repressive mark that only remains in specific sites of landing and recruitment of PRC2. Then cascade effect on the uh, regulation of other marks, like we show for K27 acetylation and activating mark that sees a global increase. And it has been proposed to um, also oncogenically reprogram the enhancer landscape and regulatory landscape of these, of these tumors. But the question that has been um, puzzling us for many years now is the remarkable spatiotemporal patterns that we see of these mutations in patients. Each mutation and uh, variant will appear in specific locations in the brain, anatomical locations in the brain. So K27M, uh, the, these mutations will hit the specific histone variant H3 and H2 exclusively in the pons, whereas in H3 it will appear throughout the midline from the thalamus to the spinal cord. Same variant, a different, a different mutation, different position, G34R or B, we will see them as, uh, exclusively in the cortex. So we have a, this pattern of distribution of mutations in the brain location, but also very, very marked for the partner associated mutations to these histone genes. So for instance, ACPR1 
a mutation that will constitutively activate a BMP signaling pathway will appear associated with this triple one in 80% of the cases in the ponds, but not frequently seen in others. So a small parenthesis here to say that this is not specific only to brain tumors. It's actually the rule, not the exception in cancer in general. Only a handful of cancer driver genes will show broad tissue specificity. The rest, even though the genes may be ubiquitously, ubiquitously expressed, will appear oncogenic in specific places in the body in specific anatomical locations. So it's a general effect in cancer. The reasons for that may be several. Um, in this particular case of pediatric brain tumors that we study, we're working under this two-step model of oncogenesis. So in the normal differentiation, normal development of the brain, normal delineation of uh, lineages in the brain, where hundreds or maybe thousands of different cell types with specific functional properties and locations and structural properties have to be determined. They are specified by uh, a progressive path in differentiation determined by stepwise um, steps where the epigenome gets global reconfigured in each one of the steps to gradually commit to these lineages. And so we need a coordinated reconfiguration of the epigenome along this path. And when these mutations appear, this process of differentiation is most likely impaired, keeping these cells in an oncogenic permissive state. So if you think about it, these uh, early progenitors in the brain are, are, are very similar to what a tumor cell looks like. They're self-renewing, proliferating, migrating, quite plastic and quite stable. And so we have them prevented from further differentiating. And then we need a second hit to produce full-blown transformation. So this is a, more or less the working model of two-step uh, oncogenesis that we have for these histone mutations. And then the question now be, here is whether the different clinical manifestations we see in the patient, in the tumors and the molecular phenotypes are caused by downstream effect of these oncogenic and quite disruptive mutations, or whether these mutations are actually hitting different lineages and different progenitors in the, in the brain and the clinical manifestation of these, tum of these tumors and the differences between the tumor subtypes are due to the state intrinsic properties in this cell of origin where the tumors, the histone mutations hit. So in order to decide to gather evidence for these two alternative models and to identify if this model is the correct one or the predominant one. The um, specific progenitors that are more likely to give rise the different lineages to these tumors. We have been undertaken in the lab, uh, my lab is computational, a dry lab, uh, a systematic strategy to compare tumors to the normal developing brain. So we have been gathering uh, producing or gathering uh, single cell resolution uh, data sets for the main, main locations where these tumors arise and deriving gene profiles, transcription factor activations and uh, differentiation trajectories from these um, uh, references in the developing brain. And then using in silico strategies to map the brain tumors and find the lineages and the states that are more uh, likely to have generated these tumors. So in the talk today, I will be presenting the work mainly of these uh, three papers that came out directly from the lab, but the strategy has been quite fruitful to interpret with different computational in silico approaches, the tumor profiles uh, in, in collaborative work with other labs too. So, the first part of the talk will deal with the cell of origin and what we did find in these uh, tumors when systematically comparing these tumor types to these references. So our main focus is hybrid gliomas that occur, as I said, in the ponds, in the midline and in the forebrain. Uh, so we generated ourselves data from the mouth and human uh, embryonic um, developing brain, single cell references for those. But we use it to map many tumors, tumor types that are presumed to originate in these, in, these in these regions. 
So I'll name a couple of findings on other tumor types first. So wind medulloblastoma uh, is another tumor type that the group of uh, Richard Gilbertson in 2010, 10 years ago, with a beautiful nature paper, proposed that they were originated in uh, lower rhombic lip precursors in the developing brain. So these precursors have give rise to the three different neuronal types. Um, and when we map the tumors, and this is mainly most of the work that I will be showing you today is the work of this amazing PhD student that is finishing this year in the lab, um, mapping these tumors with a number of complementary approaches and showing here uh, at the convolution strategy of both samples uh, using CyberSort, we saw a very clear match to the MOSI fiber neuron. So that allowed us to rule out one of the three lineages, uh, one of the lineages that where this tumor arises, refine this origin and pinpoint this. Why do we care? Because this explains several findings that had remained unexplained in the field. So for instance, super enhanced landscape again, Old papers of not so old, but you know, previous work are detecting some of the um, main regions that are activated in these tumors. And what we see is that most of the top super enhancers here are actually lineage factors that are mostly fiber marker, markers in the developing brain. So it explains a little bit the patterns that we see in the tumors and put some order on those patterns. Second case, APRT is another aggressive brain tumor that was suspected to originate very early. We didn't find in this case any match in any cell type in our uh, atlases. So we went a little bit behind uh, previous uh, developmental points using an organogenesis atlas published a year before. And what we see was here was quite interesting, at least. The one of the subtypes, but probably two, sim have similar similarities to embryonic structures that are not in the neuroectoderm. So, uh, what we think is happening here is that these tumors have probably an earlier origin outside the neuroectoderm. And again, this explains some findings in the field by other groups where uh, these subtypes of ITRTs are clustering uh, by methyl DNA methylation with extracranial. Uh, raptoid tumors and not with the um, uh, ATRTs of the SSH subtype or other brain uh, ATRTs. So coming back to our tumors of focus here, the hybrid gliomas, G34 tumors was one of the first that we uh, looked in detail after uh, doing this pass across tumor types. Um, uh, just a small uh, reminder of this tumor. This is a cortical tumor occurring in young adults and uh, adolescents that has a conflicting histopathology with a neuronal component and a glial diffuse component in the same uh, tumor type cells. Although at the molecular level, they behave like a single entity. So that's how we studied them as a single entity. And mapping the tumors, again, complementary strategies, I won't go into the details of all of those, but we can talk about them in the q and I'm showing here uh, one of the strategies, which is uh, gene set enrichment analysis uh, using as input all the gene signatures of the developing brain. So each column here will be a single cell population in the developing brain. Uh, and we see that the G34 uniquely have enrichment for the early in the neuron lineage. So enriched for radioglia, neuron progenitors, prenatal interneurons, but not the postnatal interneurons, and not the excitatory neurons, and not glial cells. So a very specific match to the interneuron lineage, which is quite telling about the origins of these tumors, the likely origins of these tumors. To, Cortical interneurons are generated in transient structures in the developing brain, in the ganglionic eminences. And the specification of these uh, neuron lineages is quite well described in the literature. Um, and the hierarchy of transcription factors determining this lineage is also quite well described. And start with this triad of transcription factor, GSX2 with its transient expression, and then followed by the TLX transcription factors. So we saw a very, very clear uh, signal in these tumors 
pointing to these uh, interneuron origins, both at the transcriptomic level, as I'm showing here, but also at the epigenome layer uh, level with um, any layer of, um, of uh, analysis that we were uh, analyzing. So looking at K27 acetylation mark, K36, uh, K27 methylation mark, repressive mark, we see that the epigenome and transcriptome landscape of these tumors point to an activation of these causally determining fate transcription factors in the interneuron layer. K27M, on the other hand, uh, I told you it can happen in H3.1 histone variants or H3.3. Uh, do we have a similar? So this, these findings were uh, published a couple of years ago uh, in cell, and I'll come back to this, uh, to this uh, uh, finding to see why we care and why we matter a little bit later in the talk. So let me just uh, tell you what we found in the K27M tumors. Again, can happen in different locations, pons, thalamus, spinal cord, uh, driven by H2.1 or H2.3. The consensus in the field for these particular uh, subtypes of uh, hydrogliomas is that they originate in an oligodendrocyte progenitor cell. So these are uh, cells in the brain that we give rise to the uh, myelinating uh, oligodendrocyte and that have accomplished a number of functions um, that are quite plastic, migrating, uh, and self-renewing through our, all our life. So the consensus here uh, by beautiful papers from Michelle Monji, Mariela Philbin, and, and others is that these tumors resemble opices. So the question we have here is, again, we're having distinct mutations and different partner mutations. Are we having uh, different manifestation by the effect of these two different histone variants and mutations? Or are we hitting very discrete progenitor niches here? And that would explain the mutational patterns and associations that we see in patients. So this model in this case could be very well the case because we see uh, quite differences in the functional properties of uh, histone 3 variants. Um, so they have different deposition patterns along the genome. H3.1 is um, uniformly expressed along the genome. Histone 3.3 deposited in telomeric, uh, peri pericentromeric and uh, centromeric regions and particularly in active uh, genes and promoters and regulatory elements. Uh, we have different association and abundance with the cell cycle. H3.1 and 2 are uh, replication dependent. H3.3 is independent of the cell cycle and much less abundant. 5% of the histone pool here is 80, I think, 80 or 90%. They have different chaperones, so all these elements could actually explain the context specificity of these mutations, the presence of different chaperones in different cells, et cetera. Also, we have the downstream effect of these mutations. So the actual effect on the genotype when uh, we remove this repressive mark will depend on the identity of these genes that should have been repressed and are not repressed anymore. So we may have a context dependence here given by the epigenome landscape and the deposition patterns of these histones. So to uncouple all these effects, so cell intrinsic epigenome landscape of the cells, uh, other cell intrinsic properties of the cell of origin and downstream effect of the mutations, uh, in collaboration always with my partner in crime, Nada Chavado, and with the amazing work of these three talented uh, PhD and postdoc students, uh, and postdoc uh, fellows, we assembled a cohort of uh, uh, more than 100 tumors and uh, 22 cell lines that we profile at different levels. So the cohort will, com will uh, consist, will um, contain H3.1 tumors, H3.3 tumors, uh, G34 as control, wild type as controls, and also we included a different tumor type that is called driven PFA and limoma because it's driven by a peptide, the overexpression of a protein, is it, that mimics the effect of K27. 
M. So we have a completely different tumor type with a similar impairment, PRC2. And we profile these tumors at different levels at the single cell uh, RNA and chromatin accessibility, follow RNA bulk, and also at different levels of uh, epigenetic marks. So this paper is very timely for this talk, appearing in this uh, week of nature genetics. So most of the results I will show you uh, about this uh, story are now publicly available this week. So now that we have the numbers to compare, we can start asking the question of what are the differences between tumors that are uh, hit by the same, the, the same mutation in two variants, different variants, but the same location, so same location, different mutations, or same mutation, different location, ponds versus talents. And we can start looking at the integration of these three uh, levels of information. Activating mark K27 acetylation, repressive mark K27 trimethylation, and gene expression. So in this level of analysis, integrating the three layers of information, what we see is a marked activation of the Hox cluster and mainly pattern in genes. So the main differences between these tumor types seem to be in these genes that where um, the primary function is to specify the body plan. So Hox, uh, Hox activation and Hox dysregulation has been reported many, many times in tumors, including these brain tumors. And so this could be, again, the effect of uh, an oncogenic reprogramming for, uh, of, of these um, um, histone mutations, particularly because the Hox genes are classic and PRC2 targeted. Um, but it could also be a reminder, a, 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 a fossil of the cell of origin and the memory of the cells of this engraving of the cell of origin and anatomical location where these tumors, where the cells were specified. So let me remind you that the Hox clusters are a beautiful example of specification of the body plan. They um, are key transcription factors that are very, very, very tightly regulated with mechanisms that are conserved all the way through uh, Drosophila or zebrafish, uh, for sure. So they have this beautiful regulation where uh, the activation along the genome is um, corresponding to the activation along the positional uh, location of the cells along the body. In the specification of the telencephalon and the spinal cord, they will be uh, each cluster will be either completely silent in the cell telencephalon or partitioning two subdomains uh, that will shift boundaries depending on the position along the anterior posterior axis. So this is what it looks like in a normal setting, a bipartite domain with half of the domain actively transcribed, marked by, a, by a histone marks that are uh, related to gene activation and the second domain repressed by PRC2 with other layers too and then with a very tight 3D chromatin structure with the, the knots tied by loops of uh, mark by CTCF. So we ask the question, what do these loss I, uh, look like in our tumors? Are they just oncogenically very disorganized? Well, the answer was no. When we profile all this level of information in each tumor type, we see a beautifully structured organization, including at the 3D level, where thalamic tumors, as they should, are silencing uh, the Hox clusters. By PRC2, remember that we, need, we, we have genome-wide depletion of this mark. But in this particular loci, it's beautifully conserved. And the himbrain and posterior fossa tumors are showing the bipartite domain, including at the 3D uh, chromatin structure with a subdomain that is active and a subdomain that is repressed by PRC2 and with the knots tied with CTCF. So beautiful structure, beautifully preserved, uh, unlikely to be the result of an oncogenic um, uh, activation of uh, random genes here. We profile all the Hox clusters, the four Hox clusters, 39 genes for each tumor types. And again, we see beautiful structure, thalamic tumors, 
silencing everywhere. Uh, the other tumor types showing bipartite domains in most of the clusters as they should, with an overall um, configuration that overall matches the location, but also shows some differences and the same location, so HG.3 tumors and HG.1 tumors show slightly differences in this uh, Hox configuration. Uh, in the thalamic uh, tumors, uh, we see silences of the Hox, silencing of these uh, Hox genes, but we see activation of a second set of patterning genes. Again, uh, most likely reminders, uh, remaining uh, uh, signals of memory in, in the epigenome grade of the cell of origin. So these patterning genes here will act similarly to the Fox, uh, Hox clusters in segmenting the uh, diencephalon and telencephalon early in development. And the configuration of these particular genes will point to a specific segment here, the prosomer 2, uh, that will give rise to the thalamus proper later on. So, and this again is uh, accompanied by a really, really striking uh, structure at the epigenome level that is specific to the malignant cells because we have single cell latex six, so we can look at the chromatin uh, structure specifically in malignant cells and not contamination of stromal cells here. Again, we see slight differences between tumors in the same location, and these are not just genomic noise or mapping. If we look in detail at the configuration, for instance, in this Hox D8 that we see active here in the H1, we see again a very structure uh, shifting of the boundary where Hox D8 belongs to the active subdomain in H1 and the inactive subdomain in H1 marked by PRC2 and with a CTCF loop uh, closing the loop here. And so conclusion here is that each one of these tumor entities associated with a variant and location seems to be originating in a specific progenitor domain. Can we narrow that a little bit further? So uh, a striking difference is that we saw when uh, zooming in in the differences in the ponds from H1 and H3 mutants is that regardless of the analysis we do, so if we look at promoter regions in the same way I was uh, mentioning before, integrating, inactivating uh, K27 ME3 with the activating K2 acetylation, K27 acetylation and expression. Or if we look at genomic beans genome-wide and rank them by uh, uh, the, um, the uh, signal in K27 acetylation, or if we reconstruct here with the help of uh, Steve Markets and Jude, uh, the gene regulatory networks from super enhancer analysis, we see this opposing signal between these two key developmental pattern in transcription factors, NKX6.1 and PAX3. Again, consistent across analysis types, consistent across modalities. So we see it at the epigenome level, H3.3, one gliomas will express NKX6.1, repress PAX3 via PRC2. We see it at the rna seq bulk uh, level, we see it at the single cell level, and we see it in the independent samples uh, kindly provided by uh, Keith Ligon and the Dana Ferber, uh, where we see it at the protein level. So these tumors, are looking like a progenitor that is expressing NKX6.1 and repressing PAX6. This points to a very specific origin for these tumors. Remember that these tumors are postulated to originate in OPCs. OPCs will have them throughout our life, but they are specified very early in gestation in different predetermined waves. Uh, so this is uh, very, very well described in mice, and we uh, suspect that in human is preserved because it's preserved across species. Uh, we have a first early wave of OPC specification in the PMN domain in the ventral neural tube. It's extremely early. I think it's a E12.5 e uh, that is specified by NK6.1. And there's a opposing gradient, gradient here with PAX3 where a second wave is the specified in the dorsal domain uh, 
and uh, lacking NK six point one and having tax three. So to recap this first part of the of the talk, what we see is that across different tumor types in the brain, uh, we see a memory of cell of origin engraved in the epigenome, but that we can pick up in uh, the transcript done too with each one of these tumors of entities originating in very discrete and anatomically distinct progenitor niches. So we have the wind medulloblastoma in the lower rhombic lip uh, in a specific lineage here, the mossy fiber. We have the G34 tumors in the ganglionic eminences in the embryonic brain and in the adult brain would be in the postnatal brain. Uh, we have the same hierarchy of transcription factors in the subventricular zone. But again, a very specific uh, lineage here, it will be the interneuron progenitors. And then for the K27M OPCs, we see a niche in the third, uh, distinct anatomical niche for the thalamic progenitors uh, than for the pontine A3.1 progenitors that are originating in the ventral part of the neural tube and the other um, A3.3 K27M Several are derived from the dorsal part, the dorsal specified OPCs. So the question is, yes, these are, you know, uh, really nitty gritty details on the anatomical locations of these uh, pro potential origins, but why do we care? So how do these explain why some mutations are completely harmless in one context, but will produce a tumor in a completely different context. So there's two cases from the ones that I showed you where we think we understood what the lineage of origin is giving us vulnerability for potential oncogenic activation and why the context matters. So the first one is the G34 that I told you where most likely originating in an interneuron progenitor cell. And Carol Shen in Nada Javada's lab also found in this same cohort that 50% of them will acquire mutations in the extracellular domain of an oncogene, PDGFRA. And even the ones that do not acquire this mutation will overexpress PDGFRA. So we have a constitutively activating mutations in an oncogene or overexpression of this oncogene tied to a specific lineage and a specific mutation, G34R, and the specific lineage of the uh, interneuron uh, cells. So the question is why do we have, and why do we see in patients this association? And we think here that the association is tied again to the specification programs of this interneuron lineage, that if you recall are causally determined by this triad of transcription factor, this transient expression of GSX2. So whenever we have GSX2 active, followed by DLX1 and 2, we commit the cells to an interneuron fate, repressing oligodendrocyte fates and other alternative fates. So this is the expression and activation of GSX2 is quite specific to its lineage. And it just happens that GSX2 is tagged in the linear genome to PDGFRA. So that gives us a clue of why we have some specificity of uh, tumors appearing in this lineage. When we look at the uh, K27 acetylation marks in, G, in G34 tumors, we see according to, you know, in agreement with the data that I was showing you before, activation of PDGFRA, uh, we know is uh, overexpressed in these tumors. So con con uh, consecutively, we see activation of the promoter. We see activation of GSX2, the lineage transcription factor uh, that commits the cells to this lineage. But we also see activation and really significant signal at the upstream elements that lucky for us had already been validated as an enhancer of GSX2, driving expression of GSX2 specifically in the progenitor niches for this uh, lineage. Um, so this, uh, this provides uh, an, a plausible explanation of the co-option of PDGFRA. And when we um, profile the 3D chromatin structure by high C of the region, we see in the tumors 
that there is a loop that is forming between the oncogene PDGFRA and the enhancer elements of GSX2. So providing an opportunity of co-opting an oncogene attached to the activating signals of this lineage transcription factory. So if the model is true, uh, and the model um, predicts that this configuration happens in the zero origin specifically, so that there's a likelihood of co-option of PDGFRA, then that's what we should um, find in the normal setting, specifically in the transient structures where these tumor, the, this lineage is specified. Um, and that was exactly what we saw when we went and profiled the ganglionic eminences, so the progenitor niche for this, we think for these tumors, the dorsal cortex, another region in the brain, and the embryonic stem cells. So let me walk you through this um, data. Uh, we have uh, uh, a loop that is forming between PDGFRA and GSX2 very early in the embryonic stem cells that is lost in the embryonic cortex, and that is formed again, but now with the enhancers in uh, the embryo in the ganglionic eminences where these tumors arise. So in this phase, the vulnerability is given by the epigenome conformation of the lineage of origin. What happens in uh, the K27M tumors? Why do we see an association with this ventral domain? Well, this ventral domain is specified again in the embryonic brain, uh, in, the, in the developing brain by a gradient of morphogens, sonic spectra on one end and BMPs on the other. And this opposing gradient and morphogen gradient is extremely robust. Dorsal cells that are specified and hardwired to uh, uh, deal with BMPs have been shown for 20 years already to be extremely robust to gene dosage changes. But the ventral cells that are not specified and not hardwired for the BMP morphogen uh, gradients uh, see a mutations activating the BMP pathway as an ectopic element. And so mutations happening in these progenitors will be dealt with, with uh, evolutionary concerned mechanisms and quite robust. But in the ventral domains, they're actually um, uh, ectopic and probably oncogenic. So we use our uh, atlases to verify that this uh, opposing gradient and robustness of the uh, networks is preserved across cell types and across time points. So this is human data across lineages, embryonic brain, and we see that less than 1% will co-express NK6.1 and PAC3. We see in the reconstruction of the regulatory networks across time points that the regulatory networks are non overlapping, sharing barely less than 10% of the targets across lineages and across time points. So, again, uh, these regulatory networks are preserved. And in tumors, uh, the dependencies of the set of origin are also maintained. So, mutations that will constitutively activate here. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, I forgot I, I had put this slide. We see regulatory elements specifically in the, in the um, tumor cells responding and regulating NKX6.1. And we see that the BMP signaling that we see in these tumors is actually dependent on the ACDR1 mutation. We remove it, we decrease the downstream post of MAP, we decrease um, the um, uh, expression of the ID genes effectors of the BMP, we decrease colony formation, and we decrease uh, tumor formation. So anatomical identity here, quite robustly specified through evolution and through development, seems to be preserving in the tumors. And again, another parenthesis, I don't think this is um, specific to the brain tumors. It has been, it's been found in other tumors like um, uh, kidney cancers and melanoma, where the positional identity of the different cells will determine the sensitivity of PRAF mutations and other oncogenes here. So the last five minutes, if I have them, um, I want to say, I want to uh, show a few results. Now that we know that the cell of origin here uh, seems to be a determinant of uh, the sensitivity of the mutations and links in the cases that I showed you, we would like to uncouple the effects from the downstream. So how much 
these cell of origin intrinsic properties are contributing to the molecular phenotype? Can we uncouple those uh, factors? So we first turn to this uh, rare patient that was present in our cohort that is caused by, that is driven, where the tumor is driven by an H3.1 mutation, but in the context of that PFA ependymoma. So we have an H3.1 mutation in a completely different cellular context. So what do the genomic patterns, epigenome patterns look like for this patient? Do they look like H3.1 or do they look like PFA ependymoma? So at the uh, K27M3 levels, is it driven an H3.1 and K27M driven uh, tumors show very similar profiles, as I was saying, that's why we included in our cohorts, but quantitatively we see some differences. In other marks, like K27M2, we see drastically different patterns, again, that we can quantify genome-wide. So what does the epigenome of this H3.1 driven ependymoma patient look like? Well, it looks very much like an ependymoma. So in this case, the cellular context of the cell of origin seems to be the major determinant of the epigenome patterns that we see in the patient. Does the H3.1 K27M mutation reprogram cell identity? Well, to answer that question, we uh, turn to single cell chipsec data from the Bing Brain Lab. We uh, obtain um, uh, single cell chipsec for OPCs and the ependymal cells, so the two different contexts where this tumor that these tumors resemble, extracted from these cell type specific epigenomic location and use these locations to cluster our patients, our patient uh, samples. And again, the uh, H3.1 ependymoma patient clusters with the other ependymoma. So it looks like an ependymoma in this clustering analysis, and it looks like an ependymoma when we look at bona fide uh, canonical ependymoma and OPC gene. So we don't see a major reprogramming of cell identity based on the mutation. We see a major contribution of the cell of origin. Uh, determining the molecular landscape of these tumors. Similar in, ex in, in, in experiments where uh, in the lab of Nada Javado, uh, CRISPR out uh, the mutation. We see that when we CRISPR out the mutation, we see a spread of the K27M3 mark. And when we replace the mutation in the same cellular context, but now H3.1, so either H3.3, H3.1, we revert back to the epigenome configuration of origin. So the same landing sites. And so the recruitment and spread doesn't seem largely independent of the specific mutation that we have in the cell. And it's mainly the contribution of the epigenome landscape with the cell of origin that is determinant. Same happens with other marks like it 27 and 2 We see a regression of a similar uh, patterns as the parental cells here when we replace in an isogenic context uh, one mutation by the other. So to conclude, what we see is that in these tumors, despite the global epigenome dysregulation that I showed you, the architecture of the key developmental and patterning genes is pretty beautifully maintained in all the cases that we looked into. We see that different Ontogenetically distinct progenitors of different origins associate with different histone variants and location, and that they maintain their vulnerabilities. We see that H2.1, K27M, specifically the uh, ones that bear uh, ACBR mutations, seem to originate in a sonic hedgehog uh, dependent ventral progenitor, and that they rely on ACBR1 for this oncogenic BMP signaling. We see in the G34 tumors. They arise in an interneuron, probably in an interneuron progenitor. And the epigenome state of that cell of origin is the one that favors the co-option of this partner mutation of progenic mutation. And with that, I think I'll, I'll, I'll finish my, uh, my uh, talk. I want to uh, acknowledge the many people that were involved in all the data that I showed, particularly the lab of Nada Javada. We have this amazing collaboration. We, daily interactions. So everything I showed you is in close, close, close collaboration with our lab. And then the many labs across the world uh, that are contributed sample knowledge, expertise, and work uh, for this uh, uh, work. 
And finally, uh, we're hiring postdocs. So if you're interested in uh, living in the beautiful and cold Montreal, just send me a message and uh, that's it. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Looking for postdocs in Montreal, beautiful city. Um, yeah. We have some questions that came in, so I'm going to jump right into the questions. Um, if anybody else has questions, you can put them in the Q&A um, button on the bottom. So the first question is, uh, you fo says, you focus your cell of origin, especially brainstem gliomas, to uh, HOX genes. Do you see similar effect when looking at other uh, HOX clusters like HOX A, B, C? Uh, do you also see H31 gliomas localized more in posterior brainstem compared to H33? So um, the Hox genes um, in in the mouse, so the uh, anterior posterior uh, positioning is very well described in the hind brain and spinal cord. The dorsal ventral activation of those uh, is a little bit less well described. So we couldn't use it that particular signature to pinpoint exactly the dorsal ventral, uh, especially in humans. So uh, there was a leap. So that's why we turn to the other set of transcription factors that are actually extremely well described for that axis. Uh, so we do some, see some subtle differences, but we couldn't put all the pieces of the puzzle together. So uh, yeah, but okay. we try to look at it, yes. So hopefully with all the new data sets that are coming out and the developing neuroscience field, we will be answering all those questions. You know, in humans, uh, uh, in detail, in the next coming um, years. Okay, thank you. Um, next question says, "I'm curious as to what these data mean for when these tumors arise. What is the timing of the first and second hit prenatal versus postnatal?" So, thank you. For, thank you very much for your insightful talk, and congratulations on your recent paper. Thank you. Uh, so that's a very, very, very important question and a, a distinction. Uh, thank you for the question because uh, I should have made maybe that one clear in our answer. So some tumors, other tumors like medulloblastomas, et cetera, are pointing to very transient cells in the developing brain. What we're seeing here is signals of specification of the uh, OPCs, but we cannot time them. So the ventral wave is earlier than the dorsal wave, but those cells are specified there and then they will remain for years in our brain. So we cannot actually time the, 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 um, the appearance of the mutation. We think for H2.1, given the location in the pons and the expansion of the pons very early postnatally, that they occur very, very early and also at the age of the onset. Uh, but what we are pinpointing is the cells, the ontogeny and the location, the anatomical locations where the cells were specified and not the timing where the mutation appeared. If that's, if that's, uh, I, if I cannot make it more clear, uh, let me know. But uh, yeah, uh, we cannot not tell anything about the timing for the OPCs in particular. So, um, the next question is also about sort of timing. Um, it says, amazing work. Um, would it be possible to use computational approaches to birth date tumors and see if there are differences in the timing of H31 and H33 pontine tumor onsets, maybe even before birth? I would love, love, love. And, you know, hopefully in the next few years, we will be working towards that. There's two big problems, uh, challenges for that is that gliogenesis is extremely different in mice and in humans. So model organisms are uh, not ideal for those timing. Uh, gliogenesis is postnatal in the mice, prenatal in the human. So we have timing differences there. And the data for humans for you know, uh, obvious reasons is very scarce uh, to obtain. So we don't have enough data to do these computational approaches yet, uh, especially in the perinatal aspect. So, there are some consortium initiatives like the Pediatric Cell Atlas uh, from Chansuk Gerbe initiative and the part of the Human Cell Atlas that probably will be generating the data for doing this analysis in the future. With the data that we have today, we cannot do that. 
So in the second part of that question from, from Jerome is um, if H31 and H33 mutations do the same thing molecularly, why don't we find H31 mutations more broadly across the brain regions? So I have, and this is, this belongs to the mere speculation. Uh, so I will speculate here openly in, in the Q&A. H2.1 is associated to the canonical, uh, to the cell cycle. So it's replication dependent. It's the positive in the cell cycle is largely abundant. Um, so there's an expansion of the pons early pre postnatally where these cells will replicate very, very, very fast. Um, H3.3 in that setting maybe gets diluted because it's only 5% of the pool of histones, whereas H3.1 is very abundant. So uh, it is more likely that mutations in those expanding cells will have an effect. Um, and so it's another prop intrinsic property of the gene of origin, but it, it doesn't have to do with the specific genes that are active, but the location where it is and the cell cycling rate of that uh, of those cells. So we have some experiments that are included in the nature genetics showing the effect of the cell cycle, but in the interest of time, I didn't show them here, uh, but we show that the difference between the two uh, are related to the cell cycle by manipulating the doubling time and the cycling rate of the cells. Okay, the last question that's come in so far is a follow-up on the Hox question. Mm -hmm. And it says, um, do, do the dorsal neural progenate, progenate, progenitors follow to Hox code? Yes, so in the telencephalon, the Hox are silent, but in the hymn brain, do follow. So yes, they do follow an anterior-posterior uh, axis there. And then the Hox is, I simplified a little bit for you know, restraining to this anterior posterior membrane spinal cord, but they're also involved in a lateral specification later in the limbs and in others. So depending on which axis you're looking at, you have to look at different Hox code. But then once we understand it and once the data is there, it's so beautifully preserved that we can use it as a passport or as a zip code of, the origin of the tumor. So, uh, yeah. Well, that's the last question that we we have for today. I want to thank you. The timing is perfect. We have five minutes to spare, so everyone can have five minutes back in their in their hour. But thank you so much, Dr. Kleiman, for doing this talk today. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing in your lab. We appreciate it.